Hi again, welcome back. Um, today we'll continue reading chapter 24 of Peak by Roland Smith. Um, quick reminder of what happened in the last video. Um, Peak was able to talk to his mom and the satellite phone who found out about, well, of course she found out about him climbing Mount Everest because he had sent her the letter saying that he was, but she's not very happy to find out that um, he's planning on summiting and she yelled at Josh for it and then Josh got mad at Peak for telling his mom that he's climbing Mount Everest and so then um, that prompted another argument before between Josh and Peak um, about various things and then in that series of um, of arguments conversations Josh revealed that that he owes Sunjo because Sunjo's father was who saved him on K2 so that's why Sunjo's going to the top not necessarily because of um, an extra security and trying to get the youngest person to the summit for his business um, and then, so because his mom now knows that Peak is, um, summoning Everest, she insisted that Josh take Peak to the summit himself. Um, she just feels safest that way, so that means that they have to rearrange all their plans. So Josh revealed to the other climbers now that Peak is going to summit Mount Everest. And none of them are happy about that either, um, because they feel like their money is being spent on trying to get Peak up to the summit instead of them. So they have threatened now to stop climbing if they say, if Peak climbs, we are going home. So they've caused quite a mess, um, and we'll find out what happens in Chapter 24. Chapter 24, Blink. The next morning, I was enduring another uncomfortable breakfast at a separate table from my team members when Josh and Thaddeus came into the tent. I thought they were going to make an announcement about the filming schedule or something, but instead, Josh said, we've reached a decision. He took a sheet of paper out of his pocket and slowly unfolded it. B team, led by Pa Song, will consist of the following members. He read off the names. A team, which I'll lead, will be... Then he read off another list of names with one very important omission my name. Before I could find my voice, the Texan spoke up, sounding almost as if as stunned as I felt. Are you saying Peak isn't getting a summit shot? Did you hear me read off his name? Josh asked tersely. No, the Texan said quietly. It's a ploy, I thought desperately. Otherwise, Josh would have told me about the decision before this brutal announcement. He was trying to get their sympathy, trying to get them to say, now hold on just a minute, Josh. We didn't really mean for you to. It was brilliant. If they decided I should come, they couldn't grass about it later. I waited for those magic words, but they didn't come. Instead, Josh looked at me. I'm sorry, Peek. I've been a jackass about this. They're right. This is their climb. They're paying the tab. I thought he was overplaying it and hoped he knew what he was doing. I thought I looked at the Texan. Now is the time for him to say, Ah, shucks, we were just having fun with you. Of course you can sew an Everest with us. Instead, he said, Well, that's settled then. Wait a second, I said. That's not fair. I work just as hard as anyone here to get to Camp 4. Let it go, Peek, Josh said quietly. I won't let it go. I almost knocked over my chair standing up. You don't have a choice, Josh said, raising his voice. It's all been arranged. Zopa's packing your gear right now. You and he and his Sherpas are heading to Kathmandu. The truck's waiting. I stared at him in disbelief. It wasn't a ploy. He'd blinked. I'm sorry it didn't work out, he continued. Maybe we can try again next year. You're young. You'll get plenty of chances to get to the summit. I don't believe this. I'll help you pack. Forget it. I pushed past him and ran outside. By the time I got to my tent, my gear was already in the truck and ready to go. So, it was all planned. Zopa, Yogi, and Yash were sitting in the bed waiting for me. I waved away my frozen tears. You should have told me. Zopa shook his head. Better to learn the way you did. The only thing I've learned is that you and my father are liars. We must leave, Zopa said calmly. We have a long way to go before dark. I glared at him, expecting more, but it was clear the discussion, if you want to call it that, was over. The driver started the truck. As we pulled out of camp, Josh stepped out of the mess tent and waved at me. I returned the wave with a gesture of my own. He returned the insult by giving me his trademark grin. If Zopa hadn't grabbed my collar, I would have jumped out of the back of the truck and killed him with my bare hands. I could not believe how quickly it had all come to an end. I mean, I knew I might not make it to the top of Everest, but I thought it would be due to weather, injury, or endurance, not some stupid business decision. 
Josh hadn't bothered to mention what I was supposed to do once I got back to Kathmandu. Wait for him, I suppose. Or maybe I was sent, being sent down to Chiang Mai. It didn't matter. As soon as I got to wherever I was going, I would call mom and find out if things had cooled off enough for me to go back to New York. The only thing I knew for sure was that I was not going to have anything to do with Joshua Wood ever again. We bumped along the rough road for a couple of miles until we came to a roadblock manned by, by Chinese soldiers. They checked our papers, then thoroughly searched the truck. This is when I realized that Sun Joe wasn't with us. I was so mad when I got booted out of camp, I hadn't even thought about him. I waited to ask Zopa until we were back on the road. Where's Sun Joe? He's waiting for us up ahead, Zopa said. It looked like Sun Joe wasn't getting his shot at the summit either. I guess Captain Sheck had made it too risky. Shamefully, this made me feel a little better. A couple miles later, the truck slowed down. I looked over at the top of the cab, expecting to see Sun Joe, but it was just a yak and a porter heading up to base camp. When we drew up next to them, the driver stopped. The porter was Gulu. He gave me a toothless smile. Then he and Zopa talked for a while, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. When they finished, Gulu waved, then turned toward, then continued towards base camp. We drove down the road for another mile or so, then came to another stop. At this rate, it would take us a year to get to Kathmandu. Yogi and Yash hopped out of the truck and started unloading gear. What's going on? Team C, Zopa answered. What are you talking about? Instead of answering Zopa, instead of answering, Zopa pulled a crumbled piece of paper out of his pocket and handed it to me. Sorry about the dramatics, but we had to make it look so good Captain Check would think you and Sunja were gone and stop looking for him. I also had to appease my bonehead clients. It was the only way I could get you to the summit before your birthday. Zopa's idea. I told you he was cagey. He'll take you up to ABC along a different route. He's under strict orders to keep you alive. If he doesn't, your mom will kill me. I hope you make it to the top, but if you don't, no worries. Josh. I read the note over twice, then looked up at Zopa. He was smiling. We will take a shortcut to ABC, he said, but we will have to move quickly before Captain Sheck discovers our, our deceit. I wasn't sure if I was angry or happy with him and Josh. It had been a cruel trick. I understood why they had done it, but they should have trusted me to play a role. I could have pulled it off, and I was about to tell Zopa this when Sunjo came over the top of a small hill and waved. Aside from the, the rumpled porter clothes and the grass in his hair from Gulu's yak, he looked ready to climb. Chapter 25 Shortcut. Gulu had hauled a lot more than Sunjo out of the porter camp. On the other side of the hill was a small mountain of climbing gear. Coils of rope, oxygen bottles, masks, tents, food. I wondered how we were going to get it to the upper camps. On our backs, as it turned out, because Zopa went right to work dividing the gear into five separate piles. As he sorted through the stuff, I asked Sunjo what was going on. He didn't know much more than I did. He said that Gulu had woken him in the middle of the night and told him that they had to leave the porter camp right away. At first I thought Captain Sheck had discovered I was there, he said, but when we were safely out of camp, Gulu told me that Zopa was, was leading you and me to the summit in a separate expedition from your father's, but still on his permit. I didn't tell him about how I found out, because I was still mad about it, and a little embarrassed. Yogi and Yasha's loads were bigger than ours, but Sunjo and I still had plenty to carry. We had most of the food divided between us. Zopa laughed as we grunted under the extra weight. It will become lighter as you eat your way through the contents, he said. There is a reason why base camp and all the other camps above it are situated where they are. The traditional route may not be the shortest way up the mountain, but it is the safest and easiest. Not that anything is safe or easy on Everest. Zopa's shortcut might have been shorter, but it was ten times more difficult than the regular route. Our first obstacle, obstacle was a vast, field, a vast field of jagged ice suck, sticking out of the ground like great white shark teeth. Sunjo and I used our walking poles so we didn't slip and impale ourselves. The Sherpa brothers didn't bother with the poles, forging ahead like they were ice skating until there were two tiny dots on the horizon. I think Zopa could have easily kept up with them, but he slowed his pace, staying about a hundred yards ahead of us so he could glance back once in a while and make sure we hadn't stumbled and we were and were bleeding out on the frozen fangs. By the time we caught up to them late that afternoon, Yogi and Yash had the camp set up, food on the stove, and were amusing themselves by blowing by throwing their ice axes at a wall of ice that appeared to brush the sky. My legs were shaking uncontrollably from fatigue. My neck and shoulders felt like they had been worked over by a sledgehammer. My only consolation was that Sunjo looked more done in than me. 
He didn't even have the strength to get the pack off his back. It took us two hot mugs of tea before we could talk. By the third mug of tea, I was able to focus enough to take a good look at the wall. It seemed to run for miles in both directions. I figured the next morning we would follow it until we came to a pass, then make our way to the top. When I mentioned this to Zopa, he laughed and pointed directly above us. This is the path, he said. You're kidding. He shook his head. There wasn't a single handhold or foothold as, hard, as far as I could see. It made the ice wall I'd been practicing on look like an indoor rock, rock climbing wall. After dinner, Zopa turned on the radio and we listened to the mountain chatter. Three more people had made it to the summit that morning. Eight had turned back within a few hundred feet of the top. A climber had broken her leg up at ABC. The virus seemed to have run its course, and everyone who had stuck it out at base camp was rapidly getting better. I was about ready to call it a day and crawl into my tent when Josh came on the radio making small talk with one of the other expedition leaders up at Camp 4. This was very unusual. Josh was a firm believer that the radio should only be used to transmit important information. He hated it when people used it like a cell phone. They talked about the weather, the woman with the broken leg, and scheduling summit attempts. Heard you had a falling out with your son, the leader said. There were no secrets on the mountain. Yeah, he left, Josh said, but we'll, we'll patch it up when I get down. He's a good kid. I think Captain Sheck was going to try to yank his climbing permit anyway. Not that I would have let him. Is Sheck still hunting for that other kid? Yep, still on the warpath. He detained a porter this afternoon named Gulu. He let him go after a pretty rough grilling, but Gulu didn't know anything. That kid left here weeks ago. Not sure what he's trying to prove. I heard he was having some more soldiers trucked in. Some of them are climbers. He's going to send them up the mountain to check the higher camps. It's insane. I send an email to the Chinese government, and I have my lawyers checking into other official actions. The Chinese make a lot of money on these permits. It'd be a shame if one overzealous soldier dried up that revenue source. But what are you going to do? Anyway, good luck at Camp 5. I'll check in with you tomorrow. Out. Zopa switched off the radio. The entire conversation had been set up for us at least on Josh's end. We couldn't part participate, but we could learn a great deal by listening. None of us liked the idea of the Chinese climbers coming in. They won't be able to get past ABC, I said. They haven't had time to acclimate. Perhaps, Zopa said. How do we get by them on the way back down, Sunjo asked. Zopa shrugged, but this time I think he really meant it. He didn't know. By the time Zopa kicked Sunjo and me out of our sleeping bags, Yogi and Yash were already 50 feet up the wall, setting ice screws so we'd have something to hook onto. The sun was barely up. They had to have started when it was still dark. We ate quickly, packed, then strapped on our crampons and harnesses. Zopa said he was staying below to tie the packs and would climb last. A bitter wind blasted the wall head-on, which was good because it pushed us into it. If the wind had been coming from an angle, it would have blown us right off the wall. Ice axe in each hand, dig crampon in, bury axe. Ice splinters in your face. Pull. To dig another crampon in. Bury axe. About sixty, about sixty-five feet up, I clipped into an onto an ice anchor and took a breather. Yogi and Yash had already reached the top, dropped ropes, and hauled up all the gear. Zopa had just started up the wall. Sanjo was clawing his way up twenty feet below me. He seemed to be struggling, which wasn't too surprising considering he had been sick and for the last few days cooped up in a porter's tent. I waited until he looked up and gave him a wave. He returned it with a grim nod. I started again and had gotten up about three steps when I heard the yell. It took me a second to get myself anchored so I could look down. What I saw wasn't pretty. Sanjo had slipped down about ten feet and was hanging on the edge of the protrusion by one axe. I'd seen the protrusion on the way up and knew it was too far from the wall to get his crampons planted in the ice. I'm coming, Zopa shouted up at him, but it would take him at least forty-five minutes to reach him. Sanjo wouldn't be able to hold on for, mo for more than a few minutes. I was a lot closer, but the only thing harder and slowing than climbing up an ice wall is climbing down an ice wall. I looked up, hoping to see Yogi or Yash, but there was no sign of them. They must have already forged ahead to set up the next camp. I didn't even have time to think about what I was going to do next, which was just as well. I started scrambling sideways across the wall to get toward the gear rope, 30 feet away. Zopa continued to shout encouragement to Sanjo. He was climbing the wall as fast as he could, but he had to know that no matter how fast he went, it wouldn't be fast enough to save his grandson. When I finally reached the rope, I gave it a tug. It seemed solid enough, but I didn't know if it would hold my weight. 
The brothers might not have anchored it properly because they were just hauling gear with it. I'm slipping, Sunjo said desperately. I'll be there in a minute, I shouted. Hang on, Sunjo, Sopa shouted, catching on to what I was trying to do. Don't give up. I wanted to test the rope more, but there wasn't time. I hooked onto it and gave it all my weight. It stretched a little, but held. I swallowed my heart and crabbed my way back towards Sunjo. When I got directly above him, I quickly hooked the rope to an ice screw I knew was secure and rappelled to him, getting the rope hooked on his harness just as his axe slipped from the ice. Got him, I shouted down to Zopa, then looked at Sunjo. You okay? He nodded. He was crying. So was I. Apparently, I had forgiven him. It took us another hour to get to the top. Zopa got there about ten minutes after us, looking concerned and relieved. Nothing broken? he asked. Sunjo shook his head. What happened? My axe broke. Zopa nodded, then looked at me. Thank you. You can thank Yogi and Yash for securing that rope, I said. The first thing I did when we got to the top was check it. The rope was tied to a carabiner attached to a three-inch ice bolt that wasn't going anywhere. Sunjo and I could have played Tarzan on that rope all day long. But you didn't know that, Zopa said. Yeah, well, I said, a little embarrassed. Yogi and Yash know what they're doing. Not always, Zopa said. One of the axes Sunjo was using today was the same one they were throwing at the wall yesterday under afternoon. Uh-oh. I suspected they were going to hear about that when we caught up to them, and I was right. When we got to camp, Zopi took Yogi and Yash to the side and spoke to them for a good ten minutes. He never raised his voice, but when they came back, they looked like he had whipped him. Two truckloads of Chinese soldiers got here today. Josh was talking to a different expedition leader who had just arrived at, arrived at ABC, along with six military climbers. The place looks like an army encampment. Glad I'm up here, the leader said. Well, you're not off the hook. From what I hear, they're heading up the mountain tomorrow morning to check everybody's papers. If you don't have your passport, visa, and permit, they're going to boot you off the mountain. We have them. What's his problem? When the truck that Zopa and my son left on yesterday got to the second checkpoint, Zopa and my son weren't on it. The driver claimed they got on a second truck and went, on, went another way. I hope your son's okay. No worries. Zopa wouldn't let anything happen to him. I'm sure they're well on their way to Nepal by now. I thought I'd just give you a heads up about what's going, down, down, going on down here. Thanks, the other leader said. What about the Chinese climbers? Are they any good? They're gung-ho and well-equipped. They pulled them off a high-altitude climb, but I'm not sure where they were. I wouldn't be surprised if they tried for the summit while they're up here. I know I would. I hear you. It's going to get crowded at the top. Zopa and the brothers spread a map out and started talking in Nepalese. What's going on? Zopa says we can't stay in any of the camps until we reach Camp 5, Sunjo explained. They're, pl they're picking alternative sites. I looked at the map. We were just about parallel to Camp 2, about 7 or 8 miles to the north. It would take us at least another day to pull up even with ABC. We could be up on the summit in less than a week. Chapter 26, Camp 3.5 Zopa pushed us hard the next two days. We were out of camp before climbing dawn with but we were out of camp before dawn, climbing with headlights. Zogi, Yogi and Yash were always long gone before we started out, but we didn't see them until we stopped at the end of the day. I had no idea where we were, but according to my altimeter watch, we were, gaining, we were gaining altitude. Not that I needed the watch. Every breath was painful now. At the end of the day, it was all Sunjo and I could do to eat a little food, drink, then crawl into our bags. On the third morning, I was surprised to open my eyes and see sunlight coming through the blue tent fabric. I looked over at Sunjo and saw that he was staring at the light, too. We had barely talked the past few days. No time, no breath. How are you doing? I asked. Not well, Sunjo said. You've done okay the past couple of days. He shook his head. It has been very hard. That was an understatement. We had done several technical climbs the past 48 hours. It had been some of the most difficult climbing I had ever done. Any idea where we are? Sunjo sat up with a groan. Feels like we're on the summit. I laughed, which turned into a short but painful coughing fit. When I recovered, I said, maybe Zopa's going to give us a day off. Not likely. We went through the contortions of getting dressed in our small tent, then crawled out. Light snow and freezing fog. We hadn't seen the sky in three days. Yogi and Yash were crouching next to the camp stove. Yogi said something that made Sunjo blanch. What? I asked. Zopa is sick. I understood why, why he was upset. Zopa didn't get sick. Zopa was the Iron Man. 
He, se he had seemed fine the night before when we got to camp. We hurried over to his tent. He looked terrible. Bloodshot eyes, runny nose, pale, but he managed to sit up in his sleeping bag when he saw us. We will go up to Camp 4 this afternoon, he said. He wasn't going anywhere in his condition. The virus? I asked. I think so, he answered with a slight smile. Or maybe it's just age. Regardless, Sun Joe said, we should go back down. We need you. We need to get you help. We cannot go down, Zopa said. The Chinese are waiting for us. Our only escape is up. But we have to come down eventually, I said. But not on this side. What are you talking about? Nepal is a little more than a mile away from here. I thought he was delirious or something. It would take us days to reach the friendship bridge into Nepal. He took out the map and pointed to the south side of the summit. This is Nepal, he said. He pointed to the north side of the, of the summit. This is Tibet. He walked his fingers up the north side of Everest, then down the south side. You mean we're not coming back down the north side into, into Tibet, I asked. When you reach the summit, he said, you will head south into Nepal. But we're not set up for the south side, I pro protested. We don't have tents or gear or... Sherpas will help you, Sopa said. Friends of mine. We have already gotten word to them. They will be waiting on the other side. Yogi and Yash will take you to the summit. What about you, Sanjo asked. As you can see, I am in no condition to climb. Camp 4 is as far as I will be going. Then we'll wait until you get until you get better, Sanjo insisted. That's right, I said. I don't care if I get up to the summit by my birthday. It's not important, to me anyway. We'll set up a camp somewhere, or stay right here until you get better. Sopa shook his head. We don't have enough food or supplies. Yogi and Yash can get more supplies from the other Sherpas. That is not the only obstacle, Zopa said. The weather. In three days, it will be good for a summit attempt. You will have to be in position. I glanced back outside. It was snowing harder and the fog had thickened. How can you know that? Sopa shrugged. He was impossible. Okay, I said. So the weather breaks and we make it to the summit and somehow make it down the south side. How are you going to get past the Chinese soldiers on the north side? I am a Nepalese citizen in Tibet with legal papers. Captain Shek has no grounds to arrest me. You saw what happened the last time he tried. I don't think I would be caught, but if I am, the very worst he can do is deport me, which is what I want anyway. I'll see you both on the other side. I don't think I can make it to the summit, Sanjo said. I had a lot of trouble yesterday. I am afraid I have put you in a terrible situation, it, it, terrible situation, Sanjo, Zopa said. You have to make it up to the summit now. I thought about offering to stay with Zopa at Camp 4 and help him down the mountain after he got better, but this was clearly not in keeping with my mother's instructions to stay selfish, and I did want to get to the summit. The debate was resolved by Zopa. He gave me a monkish smile. I don't need your help, Peek, but Sanjo will. I just stared at him, relieved I didn't have to make the decision, and stunned that he seemed to have read my mind. How? Zopa held up his hand. Sanjo will not reap the, reach the summit without your help, he said. I need to rest, and so do both of you. We have a hard climb ahead of us. Sanjo took Zopa's advice. I tried to sleep, but couldn't. I joined Yogi and Yash at the fire. Yogi pulled out an oxygen tank and mask out of his pack. He showed me how to attach the mask to the regulator, then he held up two fingers, indicating I was to set the dial to two liters per minute. Then, using Yash as a model, he showed me how to put on the mask. When he finished, he took everything apart and had me put it all back together. It wasn't as easy as it looked. I had to pull out my I had to pull off my outer mitts and my fingers went numb in spite of the fact that I was still wearing gloves. They, this reminded me that I still had JR's little video camera in my pack. I had completely forgotten about it. I needed to start filming our trip, which should give you a little idea of how the brain functions or doesn't function at high altitudes. I managed to get the mask hooked up to the tank, then I put the mask on and tried to adjust the straps for a tight fit over my nose and mouth. The mask was cold, uncomfortable, and a little claustrophobic. Yash had a perfect solution to the discomfort. He turned on the oxygen. In my entire life, I had never felt anything so wonderful. The O's flowed into my body like some kind of magic elixir. For the first time in weeks, I felt warm, sharp, and strong. The feeling was short-lived because Yogi turned it off almost immediately. Reluctantly, I took off the mask. The Sherpa brothers were smiling at me. Yogi said something in Nepalese, then held up five fingers. Got it, I said. Not until Camp 5. Theoretically, you could use O's all the way up the mountain. The problem was that you would have to use half a dozen Sherpas to carry enough oxygen tanks to get up the mountain. 
The tanks didn't last that long. Yogi and Yash left around noon. A couple, a couple hours later, Zopa came out of his tent looking like a corpse emerging from a tomb. Three mugs of hot tea seemed to revive him. A little. I packed his gear, then roused Sunjo, who looked a lot better after his nap. We started out for Camp 4. This time, Sunjo and I had to wait for Zopa. About halfway there, he put on an oxygen mask and cranked it up. This certainly put a little more spring in his step. I was envious. That's the end of chapter 26. Um, we'll continue with chapter 27 and read until the end of the book in the next video.